real big mama is about 65 years old. We are from the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. It's a sanctuary right off the Olympic Peninsula, uh, starting at Nia Bay and ending at the Grama Copalis River area. Jim Ingram uh, since last year. You remember Jim was here. Now Jim passed away just a few months ago. And that's Jim there. Um, those lights go down anymore? Kind of right up here. But um, there's me and there's Jim in uh, People magazine. I believe it's 1995 just after the infamous Tub Toys spill. Does that make sense? It took us five hours and we got chlorine poisoning because we had to be five hours in the pool to get that one shot in <laughs> on one page of People magazine. And they're still washing up. Those toys are still washing up. Which is hard to believe. Which is a sign of, it's, it's the sign of Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. It's a sign of the power of our technology that a, a creature like this can actually survive in the ocean for 25 years. And they actually have survived through the Arctic Ocean to Texas, to fro uh, a frog in Scotland, a duck in Maine, a beaver in Texas, and uh, by the Exxon Valdez, there was a uh, frog recently found. These toys are incredibly tough. You may, have remember, may recall when I was um, I guess somebody's in the next room. I guess that's what's going on. You may recall when I, when these started going through the Arctic Ocean, Jim Ingram said. Ah, oh, no, they can't go through the Arctic. They, they'll crack in the ice. So I took one and put it in my freezer for a year. Got a 10-pound sledgehammer, went out on the sidewalk, and proceeded just to beat as much as my uh, little body could go, and it would not crack. These are tough toys. Could, uh, is that bad noise bothering anybody? Okay, I guess we're all right. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, here is son Dave. Uh, he's out at the booth. Somebody's got a man in the booth. You notice my uh, little logo says uh, retired oceanographer. I'm here to tell you that the word retired is an irrelevant word. When you do what you love, you do not retire. To be like. Uh, That'd be like Johnny Cash going to Folsom Prison. He's, he's singing. He's singing to people who love him. So um, Dave, if it wasn't for Dave, Dave brought me down. And um, he tells his puns as much as his father. <laughs> Next. I uh, also want to say we also lost last year, year before last, we lost Jane Woodwick. Now, these are, Gene is a cornerstone of why we're here. Jim is a cornerstone for global warming. The oceanographic community doesn't recognize him, but he is the one who ran the computer models of 
how the ocean actually circulates by winds day by day. And he ran that model uh, and put trash in it. And it was just wonderful work. I'll show you some of his work in a little bit. Next. Uh, the Beachcomber Alert now has a new format. It has um, put together by a friend of mine. We're just trying to experiment with different formats. Might make it easier to read. Um, there is, um, what I'm trying to say is, uh, there's a whale on the lower part. Of the, I put the whale on the cover this time because every whale that washes up, and I get reports from worldwide, every whale has 20 to 80 pounds of trash in their stomach. And I know that from my beachcombing friends over in Europe who do tremendous work on on autopsy, bird autopsies, um, that they have found um, flotsam, marine debris in every bird's stomach. But now we have a planet where the whales have, have uh, all the whales have trash in their stomachs and the, all the birds have trash in their stomachs. And um, it makes me wonder, when's it going to stop? What's next? And I hear from my Swedish friends that we actually, humans, have plastic in their innards. So you might ask if you have a friend who's in surgery, if the surgeon could tell you if there's any plastic in your friend's innards. So um, I'm sure somebody knows. Next. This is Jim Ingram's uh, circulation of uh, the gyres on the planet. The planet is covered with 11 great circles of current. Um, they've been around for the last 15 million years. Um, you can see, you see the green line in the Pacific Ocean and the blue line just to north of it, just south of Alaska. Those are gyres. There's one in the South Pacific one in the Indian Ocean, there's one in the Atlantic Ocean. Do you see the uh, Atlantic, North Atlantic Ocean? Those are all gyres. And believe it or not, I get a lot of criticism for being a gyrist. <laughs> My profession doesn't really believe in them. And they are virtually unexplored. Now if you look closely, you'll see See the little gold, looks like little dust bunnies in the middle of the gyres? Well, they are dust bunnies. They're planetary dust bunnies. I don't know about your house, but I have dust bunnies. My wife doesn't get around much. So I, if I see a dust bunny that gets over four inches in diameter, I'll pick it up. <laughs> and I put it in the garbage. So I think, well, that's. Every time I pick up a dust bunny in my house, I think, ah, ah, that's a planetary dust bunny I just removed. And now we're st I'm starting to get more and more people going out in sailboats and going through the garbage patches to pick up the garbage patches. Of course, it's almost impossible. We have to stop. We have to end the idea of trash being in the ocean. How many of you? Um, how many of you remember the days when people would toss garbage fulls, bags full of trash, out the car, and it would pile up along the freeways? Do you remember all? Do you remember that it was considered just kind of accepted practice? Well, those days are gone. It's now it's considered accepted practice for there to be just a clean freeway. If you see trash on the where you get upset. If you see somebody throw a cigarette butt out the window, you get upset. We have major industries that don't get upset, like the container industry. They lose a thousand containers every year, overwork, and yet you don't, they don't have to report it. 
You don't have to clean it up. They are the, the villains of the 40s come forward to the present day. But we have lots of people like the weather bureaus. You know, when the weather that you like to see, it takes a million launches a year of weather balloons. Each one has electronics underneath that radios back the weather data to a thousand weather stations around the planet. Each one of those balloons has beneath it a plastic box the size of my little girl scout cookies, but it's full of hazardous waste. But there's no law to clean it up. About 200,000 go into the ocean every year. And every time I come down here, I'll probably get like half a dozen people bring it, come up to me and say, what is this? I say, well, that's hazardous waste from the US Weather Bureau or international agencies. Next. Uh, this is a view looking down on the North Pole and it's got some black lines. The point is that the point is that the black lines connect the gyres around the North, Northern Hemisphere. The Northern Hemisphere is connected by most of the gyres. So if something that goes in in the North Atlantic will be over here probably in 10 years. Something that goes over in the ocean here will be over there in 10 years. It only takes 25 years to go around the planet for a piece of flotsam. Yeah, that sounds like a long time. But I want to tell you that the last issue of the Beachcomber Alert has two stories. One of a bottle that was out for 29 years. It was found in the Hawaii Islands. And another found in Arctic Alaska that would have been out for um, 50, uh, 50 years. It's getting to be fairly common to find bottles that have been out 30, 40, 50 years floating. And that big green dot down there is where we found a frog in one of the frogs that was uh, fell overboard up off Alaska. It took 25 years to get there. So I'll, I'll put a fine point on it. How many of you want your last remains cremated? Or how many want to go into the grave as a, a coffin? How many want to be cremated? And I see most. OK. I, I'll raise my hand. So the point is, when mom and dad died, they asked me to keep their ashes in my desk drawer until they were both gone. So I did that. And then they said, when we're both gone, take us up to Ross Lake and put us in the water. And I said, no. I, said, well, I just did that. I was a busy guy. And so I went up to Ross Lake, and my brother was there. And we said, well, how are we going to do this? We got a white five-gallon bucket, and we mixed up the ashes, and we threw them overboard. And Mrs. Scott said, well, now what happens? The last I saw my parents, they were dancing in the white caps on, in July of 96, dancing across the waves at Ross Lake. So I put that in flotsam metrics, and I said, well, now. But I kept a little bit of the ashes back, and I measured how long they settled in the ocean. <coughs> and it took 25, well, it took 10,000 years for the finest ashes to get down through the ocean. And I said, well, that's interesting. It only takes 25 years to go around the planet, but it takes 10,000 years for the ashes to settle through the ocean. And I think that's. There's some prophetic time scales there. I haven't figured out the true meaning of 10,000 years settling in the ocean. But you might contemplate that when somebody asks you to put your, your ashes in the water for the Neptune Society. Does the Neptune Society realize that it's going to be 10,000 years? Do they have a policy that could last that long? Um, but I'm, usually, I'm the kind of scientist who will question till 
the, what's really going on will be found out. I don't question things until the regulatory guidelines say, well, that's all you need to study. No, I will keep going until I know what's really going on, and so I can tell the oil industry, no, half of your oil sinks and floats in the water. Boy, you would have thought I spit in God's eye when I, when I say things like that. When I said that debris was going to come from the uh, Japanese tsunami and come over here in large amounts, NOAA at, was going to Congress every day in the Senate reporting what I had been saying. And they called, one day the head of the Marine Debris called me and said, Kurt, you've got to stop talking about this. You, everybody knows there can't, stuff can't come from Japan and land in Washington. <laughs> and I said, what? I said, you, you, she says, stop talking about it, literally, quote, unquote. And I said, well, she says, I have to go to Congress and report what you said. And I said, well, you might want to listen to what I say. You might learn something. So I get that kind of blowback from industry all the time. Uh, next. Now, this is the kind of provenance Noah criticized me for not having provenance. Well, here is a bottle released off of Wood, at Woods Hole, and it wound up in San Francisco. It has a number. It's in the, it's in the archives, federal archives of NOAA. And it took 25 years to go drift from Woods Hole all the way to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Now, that is provenance. We have irrefutable evidence that stuff drifts all around the planet. Next. Now, this is we're zeroing in out in the North Pacific. You see the red line going around. It says Aleut Gyre. And the green line going around, and that's Turtle Gyre. I named the gyres. You would have thought again I'd spit in the God's eye. And I, they said, what are you naming things for, Kurt? Because you love them? No, people don't name things. And I said, well, how about hurricanes? You name those. Oh, that's different. <laughs> so I, I named all 11 gyres on the planet. And I got all kinds of grief from the scientific community saying, you can't do that. I said, well, it's too late to take it back now. And it wasn't long before I talked to the LA Times. You see the uh, turtle gyre? Do you see the garbage patch with the gold, gold plastic in it? I blurted out one day, well, I, they said, where are the ducks now? And I said, well, they're out in the garbage patch. And the LA Time guy says, oh, what's that mean? I said, that's where the ducks are congregating out there. That's, and he says, what do you mean? I said, that's where plastic, this is back in the 90s, that's where plastic collects. <laughs> and he says, but, I said, that's the garbage patch. And it stuck. You know how when you throw spaghetti at a wall and you think nobody's watching? It did stick. <laughs> it really did stick. Uh, and now I can talk to people on the plane and, and, and we'll be talking about something mundane like politics. And now I'll say, I'm the guy that named the garbage patch. Everybody I talk to on airplanes, they know who, they know what the garbage patch is. So sometimes naming things can really be advantageous. It may seem stupid, but people need to have names. So now I've been wondering, well, maybe I was too timid. Maybe I should name all the garbage patch on the planet. And there's about eight of them. So I'm not sure if I'll get the chance or not, but I don't know. Next. Um, now, Glass balls are primarily what people, what beachcombers are interested in here. And you all know that there were 100 million or so uh, released since 1911. And through about 1960, most of the glass, most of the balls used for fishing were glass. Now most of them are plastic. 
But the glass ones are still floating, and I would guess there's a few million still out there after a century. It's, it's an amazing scientific experiment that the gyres are actually whisking these around the Pacific and the planet. Next. Um, I get all kinds of stuff in the mail. Do you see on the far right, that's a coffee cup. You remember the MH370? You see it on television. They still haven't found it, right? I have friends out there looking for it. And they send me, they'll put down their coffee cups and send them down to where they're looking for the MH370 at about 13,000 feet. And when the coffee cups come back, there is, that's what it looks like about about an inch, inch, inch tall. And that's what the ocean will do to a coffee cup. When I see a coffee cup here, that's what it'll do to a coffee cup at 13,000 feet, <coughs> which is pretty interesting. I even did that back in the 70s. I would get bored when you're out in the Bermuda Triangle looking for things, which I still can't talk about because I was working for the Russian Navy. Uh, and I would get things back, and they would look like that. But then I would look out on the surface of the ocean, and the ocean would be covered with styrofoam plastic coffee cups back in the 70s. But back then, my consciousness was just to earn a living, and I just didn't think much of it. Now I can see those images for what they really were. They were a warning to me personally, and a warning to humanity. Because the Bermuda Triangle is nothing more than a garbage patch. Next. Uh, here is where glass balls go. Upper left, where it says start, you see in Japan, there's uh, about 11 balls. And you see along North America, there's about another 11 or 12 or 15 along North America. The whole point of this little exercise, and this is Jim Ingram's work back in the 90s, what happens to the floaters for the next 20 years or so? So you see on the next where it says one year, you see where the red dots are now at the middle of the Pacific, and the blue dots are now gone around Alaska, Gulf of Alaska, and they're coming down to Hawaii. That's one year drift of glass balls. Just one year drift. It shows you how fast the ocean is. Imagine having a two-year-old, and the two-year-old never sleeps. And you say, where is Junior now? Well, it turns out that Junior moves, she just never sleeps, 24 hours a day moving on the, before the wind on the ocean. It's amazing. Look after three years. The red dots are now in the garbage patch. The blue balls are now around the Gulf of Alaska and, and, and also are almost over to the Philippines. And after 10 years, can you see the big red spot that looks like it's Jupiter? That's where the, the glass balls collected. I see Dan says, aha, I know where to go. <laughs> And if you get a boat, that's where to go. I have got emails from sailors who go through the garbage patch. So there's a lot of glass balls, but they're very patchy. There's something along lines, there's lots of little collection spots. And I've had scientists in scripts say, well, we went out there and we couldn't find anything. Sometimes you hit it, sometimes you don't. But the garbage patch is very patchy, but you've got to go out and spend your time. And I'm used to going out for a month or two at a time and looking. You've really got to look hard to find these. But when you find the mother loads, they're out there. Next. Now this is, I made this, uh, Jim, Ing Jim Ingram made this for the uh, look back at the tsunami debris, and you see over in Japan on the far left, can you see those five little dots? They're black dots, and that's 
the where the uh, tsunami, where the earthquake struck. Now notice on the North America where they washed up in the next uh, th two, three, four, five years. Notice how they washed up from Alaska all the way down to Hawaii. Do you see that magenta patch, the great garbage patch? Notice how the debris from Japan just spread out enormously over a few year period. So when you think of debris from Japan, it's not, it doesn't just come across concentrated. It spread, it fans out. That's, that's a lot of fanning out. And it started out in a few hundred mile range in Japan and it wound up over several thousand miles in the Pacific and North America. So, next. This is a kind of a little summary. Uh, some of the debris from Japan went straight across to Washington, where we are. Some of it went around the red line, around the garbage patch. You see the garbage patch is the golden plastic. I don't know why I made the plastic golden. But I don't, can't find a picture for disgusting plastic. Except I'm a, I've worked with so many sanitary engineers. If I made it the real color, you'd probably go running screaming out of the room because it's just disgusting. I have friends who have gone out over like the Hyperion Outfall, off where I was born in El Segundo. And they go out in a small boat and they, they'll wear moon suits and they'll collect the oils and greases right from the surface out there and they won't, they'll get it in little plastic vials and they won't, they won't open those vials because the, the stuff is so disgusting. But that isn't written about. And I would argue that we're losing the environment because what's really going on is not written about by government regulators. Next. Well, Flotsam makes headlines. Uh, next. Uh, this is, uh, these are utility poles being made in Japan. This didn't make the headlines except if you were a billionaire yacht racer going in the Trans-Pacific yachts that ran from LA to Hawaii. These are billionaires little toys. Meanwhile, the guys in Japan were making these utility poles. Next. Here's a billionaire's yacht, the Lending Club. I've never heard of it before in my life. Um, probably a few million dollars, I guess. I don't know. Um, and this is, this is something you hardly ever hear about. Next. Now here, here is a rather complicated plot. You see on Japan over you see the three stars, a blue star, a red star, and a green star. See how they all start in Japan and see how they come across. Those are the drift tracks of those utility poles. I had asked Jim, I said, where do you think those utility poles went? He says, I don't know. I said, well, you've got the model, you've got Oscars. When he and I were in college together in 1968, he was just starting out. 30 years later, he was actually had perfected, you could actually put in their utility poles and see where they went. And this is what he, he mailed me a couple days later. I, I said, what did you get, Jim? He says, well, I, I put three of them in there and this is where they went. So I superimposed them on those yachts. You see the blue dots going from Southern California out to Hawaii, nice line. That's, that's what shows up on a billionaire's screen. All the billionaires got a, got a nice surprise. The, you see how the utility poles came along, they went around the garbage patch, and they intersected that nice blue line of yachts. There was like 50 yachts out there. And guess what happened? The billionaire's yachts ran into the utility poles. Nobody lost their lives, but people lost their trophies. 
didn't make much news, but in the racing community, this is the the, the best thing that a billionaire could, could take home is this trophy. Been running, it's been going on for like a century now. Um, next. Oh, we can talk about death in the Pacific. I don't know. Uh, next. I lost track of how much time I got. But um, I get a lot of things in, in my mail that you don't want to read about. Like, see, you see those on the left, you see that gray plastic urn-like thing. That's, that's an octopus trap. See where it says M-Y-O-M? -M? That's the name of the Portuguese fisherman off, uh, well, I think North Africa is where he put them. And you see the map, you see the black dots and the blue arrows. And over there, these, these octopus traps go around the blue arrows in the North Atlantic. And so it wasn't long before I was getting emails from Swedish scientists saying, Kirk, do you know what those traps are about? And I said, well, they're, they're going all over the North Atlantic. And I, he, they said, yeah, but do you know what octopus eat? I said, I said um, no, not really. They're eating stuff off the bottom, and then they curl back in their pot, and that's their home. But do you know what's on the bottom? What we're finding in the pots, it's like it snows outside, and you walk in the house, and you track snow in. That's what the octopus do, only the, the snow is muddy. We're finding hazardous waste and chemicals in the bottoms of the octopus traps. And I've, I've heard a few of those, and then there's been a, a silence. So when I go to the restaurant, <laughs> and people say, Kurt, what are you going to have to eat? I stay away from the octopus, because it's sort of like tuna. Remember how tuna used to be uh, a no-no because it had a lot of mercury? Well, now it's octopus traps. Now it's octopus. And there's a lot of other things going on out there that you just don't hear about. Uh, this is my, um, my mentor. And we were talking about Frog Daddy and I were all talking about mentors. I had about six mentors that got me to where I'm at today. This is one of them, Cliff Barnes. Uh, he routed, uh, he helped Admiral Oldendorf route ships across the Atlantic to feed Britain. <clears throat> the point is, he put out these uh, daisies, sea daisies, you see them in the upper left there. Uh, they were launched by the tens of thousands in uh, the 1960s and they're still washing up. Do you see on the upper right, do you see the line there, it's kind of, see Washington State coastline, and you see the Strait of Juan de Fuca. That large black line in the water is where the sea daisies went up along the coast, in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and into Puget Sound. Dixie Lee Ray was the, was the leader of the Atomic Energy Commission at the time, and she wanted to know where the radioactive sediments were going from Hanford back in the 60s. Pretty courageous work compared to the government blowback we got from where did the Fukushima radiation go? I got lots and lots of grief. Nobody wanted to know. Well, these results really do show that the Hanford radiation went along the coast and came into Puget Sound. So we have a different mentality toward scientific data today and scientific data yesterday. I'm probably running over, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, or I can sit here and uh, entertain you with more grisly stories. <laughs> what would you like? You want, can you sit a little longer, or what? Yeah. OK. Uh, if you want to leave, then just have at it. Next. See, Davies, I've been impressed in the last Few year, next, I've been impressed in the last few years with the number of really old bottles, 50 to 100 years that have been reported. 
And I'm beginning to see that we're actually getting the ocean to tell us that things wash around her planet for a century. Next. I wanted to, maybe I'll just close here. This is one of Jim Ingram's very finest computer runs. This is a bottle that was out in the Gulf of Alaska for, I don't know, 30 years. It went four times around the Gulf of Alaska. I went up to the Sitka Chamber of Commerce and, and gave a talk to the salmon fishermen. And they, they said, Kurt, you know that our fish up here are, are half the size they used to be. The salmon, we're talking about salmon in Sitka. This is, this is big time stuff, you know. I'm, I saw a bear trap right in front of me. I said, what is going on here? And I asked them, I said, you're the experts, what is what is going on? He says, is it just one or two of you fishermen or is it everybody out here? He says, oh no, it's it's pretty pretty common. You fishing derbies, you're lucky to get a 30 pound salmon. You used to get 60 pound salmon. The, the size of the fish is just a lot smaller. He, sa he says, what do you think's going on? And I said, well, just, just my gut reaction is, and I showed this slide. I said, you think of global warming as being like on a stove. And you think of the ocean. What do you think's going on in the ocean? Do you think it's just slowly heating, like a, like a boil of a pot of soup? About all Susie and I can afford these days is a pot of uh, progressive tomato soup. So I went, I said, I said, no, if you watch the tomato soup, it starts boiling, but it, it comes up in little boils. And if you put, if you use water, you see that the water in the pot, it actually boils. So to me, global warming is just kind of like a sleight of hand. It's not the whole ocean warming uniformly. It's the boils of water coming to the surface. And one of the first places on the planet that we see a boil is right there, Gulf of Alaska. That boil has been um, observed by NOAA for 30 years now with satellites. Jim just ran a, the simulation. So you have, I think, one of the first global boils actually documented in what I would call not just global warming, but global boiling. And I think in the next 50 years we'll find more and more boils. And, that, and so the fishermen got tired of my oceanographic blathering. And they said, what does it really mean, Kurt? And I said, well, what it means is that boil right there is warm water going around in a circle. And if all you guys know that warm water up here in Alaska means less food value for the fish. If you have, that water came from the equatorial regions, it's warmer, it has, it has less food for salmon, that's why your salmon are smaller. And it's been, it's been building like this for 30 years, maybe a lot longer, we don't, the satellites aren't around. So what's going to happen? Uh, I said, it's my guess that that boil is just going to keep boiling and get, you know, worse, hotter, bigger, and I would guess that the salmon will keep getting smaller and smaller. I think down here we've even seen smaller fish. So we're seeing equatorial water come up and actually feed global boiling. And Jim, Ingram was the first one, I think, to really document the drifting part, because Noah just showed the temperature part, which is great work. And Jim showed this drifting from this one bottle, which is wonderful. Next. I was in the museum in the back room about three or four weeks ago, and I discovered something I didn't know we had. It is 15 chapters have been typed the history of the North Beach, 15 different chapters, and it was called Olympic North Beaches Then and Now. 
when I started reading through it, I go, oh my god. I learned some things I had no clue about. So, you might want to know where the name Olympic North Beaches came from. This is a document. Signed by the Secretary of State of Olympia in 1958 for the Hoquiam Chamber of Commerce, calling this portion of the beach Olympic North Beaches. <coughs> and this is the brochure they put out. You're welcome to look at this later on. I want to bring a ton of stuff here, but that was impossible. I'm doing something different. I don't want to start with chapter one. I want you to decide what the chapter is going to be first. So, would somebody like to pick you? Yeah, okay. We're starting with part one of German and <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you. That's the way it should be. If you don't mind, I'm going to sit down. My legs are killing me. Stand up all day. So, again, What's here represents some of the topics, not everything. Okay, can you hear me? Part one, a German and an Irishman. In the late 1880s, C.B. Horn, a German migrant from the East Coast, had taken up homestead land south of the Pales River on the North Beach of Grace Harbor. His claim took in timbered highland and lowland that reached out to the ocean front. There were, at that time, no roads. The only access was by the way of the beach. Horn and his wife, who, by the way, her name was Catherine, proceeded to build a modest log cabin on their pioneer homestead. Later, as new family members came along, a two-story frame house was constructed on the high ground overlooking the Pacific Ocean. This home sported an old-fashioned parlor, complete with carpeting and rugs. There was even an old grandfather clock, which reached from floor to ceiling. Other antique furniture added a certain warmth to the cozy room. On the walls were several old-style family portraits, majestic in their massive oaken frames. The utilitarian kitchen was complete with an ancient, hand-powered well pump. There were several bedrooms, both upstairs and down. walk through everything about brazier clams so you understand the concept of 15 clams regardless of size or condition. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the concept. If I dig one up and it's too small, why can't I put it back? And it's going to make good sense to you when we're all done. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about life history first. Then we're going to talk about how do they manage how many clams, how do they know where the big ones are, how do they tell people where to go clam digging, unusual things you see on the beach when you're clam digging, and then we're going to talk about what does the violator look like. The, what violators look like is just absolutely fascinating, and I've, I've looked at all the tickets six different times over a 30-year period to figure out what does a violator look like, and it's, it's really mind-blowing. So the first thing we're going to start about is if you have questions too, if I don't explain uh, properly, please raise your hand and I can go back any time. But to understand how the resources manage, we have to understand the biology of the clam. And we're going to start in the upper left-hand corner, and we're going to come counterclockwise on this um, life history board here. And later on, if you can't see it, don't worry. I'll stay here, and you can come up and take a closer look. But razor clams are separate sexed. There's male and female clams. And a lot of people will think, well, so what? Everything's male or female. And it's not true for the animals in the ocean. There's a lot of anomalies. For instance, if you eat shrimp, um, shrimp only have male offspring. And the reason for this is nature has learned that a big, strong female translates into bigger, stronger, viable offspring. So when you're having fried prawns, you're eating girl shrimp. When you have shrimp on a pizza, shrimp on your Caesar salad, you're eating the boys. And the little tiny boys, when they're about a year and a half old, change sex and become functional females. And the kids just get a big kick out of this. So, um, and, very, and very often, the little kids will pick up very quickly. They're very sharp. Well, who's mating with whom? And um, it's little boys mating with big girls all the time. So it's a chicken and the egg. Little boys are born. They grow up to become girls. The girls mate with the little boys and have more babies. So that's what's going on with the shrimp. When you have oysters, oysters almost are all male. There are a few male, um, female shrimp uh, oysters born that stay female, 
but if you're a male oyster when you're three years old, you're gonna change sex. And the same thing holds true here. A bigger viable female means bigger, more viable offspring. Well, usually if I tell children this, the little boys are devastated. So to make it fair, there are many things in the ocean that only have girl offspring. Usually aggressive fish, grouper, sea bass, wrasse, angelfish. These have only female offspring because a big aggressive male can protect a lot of territory and protect a lot of females. So uh, in the movie, for instance, Finding Nemo, Nemo's a clownfish. When coral is killed by the barracuda, what's gonna happen is Marlin's gonna change sex and become Nemo's mother, basically. He's gonna be looking for a new mate and he'll change sex. And about eight years at age, Dory is gonna have a girlfriend. The next movie's gonna have to be called Finding Nemo, because Nemo doesn't know it, but at eight years old, he's gonna change sex, because he'll be a big female, which means more viable offspring. So there's a lot of funny things going on in the ocean, but razor clams are separate sex. And the only way you can tell is in the springtime. What they call the fat in the clam is really reproductive material. So when you cut the digger open of a really fat clam, late spring, May and June, you open it up. If it's creamy and even consistency, like sour cream, that's a male. If it's granular, like wet sugar, that's a female. So they're broadcast spawners. They shed their eggs and sperm right into the water, and it's a chance meeting. So a full-grown razor clam at about two years of age will have 10 to 20 million eggs. So when the eggs are shed in the water, they're about half the size of a grain of sand. So this gray picture here is one clam egg and half of a grain of sand. We're talking in terms of microns. Well, they hatch in about 48 hours. They're born without a shell, and they're called villagers, and they swim around the water without a shell for another 48 hours. And then when they're starting to get a shell, they look like a fat letter T with a mustache, and they spin around like a, with a hula skirt in the water. And then they have an organ called the shell gland that pulls calcium out of the water and builds a shell around the baby clam. The baby clam now is the size of a grain of sand, and they settle, start settling to the ocean floor. The spawning, the nursery area for the Washington State razor clams was discovered in 1985, and it's up off the Copalis Rocks. There's a submarine canyon there up near Pacific Beach in Mo Cliffs. It's about a half a mile, a mile offshore. And we discovered in 1985 that both species of razor clams, there's a deep water species and a shallow water species, they settle into this canyon, probably August and September. When we're getting to September and October, they're now the size of a grain of sand. They come up out of the canyon wall. They actually will go up the wall using their digger, hop up the wall, catch the waves, and the deep water babies head west, the shallow water babies head east. And we don't know how, how they know whether they're on a deep water baby or a shallow water baby. But they know, and they start moving towards the beach. And the currents are carrying them like dandelion seeds, on the beach, off the beach. So they start up there, and then they start fanning north and south. So the densest population of razor clams is near that canyon. But then they're being disseminated north and south. So Long Beach Peninsula normally gets the end of the, the babies of that year. And so you'll see this area, and Twin Harbors has a little less, and Long Beach a little less. So the nursery area for the whole coast is there. It's also where baby rockfish and baby crab go. It's like a giant daycare facility down in there. They've got pictures down in there. It's pretty amazing. So they come up on the beach, and they don't have the ability to hold on until they're nine months old. So at nine months of age, their digger is strong enough to hold on where they're at. So until that point, each tide is moving them around. So what happens once we get to be nine months old, where we hit the beach is where we're gonna spend the rest of their life. They do not move, it's just up and down. So some years they're deposited high, some years they're deposited low, some years nine months hits when they're offshore. So what looks like we lose a year class is not really a lost year class at all. They most likely settle in deep water. So they grow very, very quickly and they'll reach two and a half inches in four years. And that's when they're sexually mature. Oh, so a four inch clam takes about two and a half years. Then it really slows down and the lifespan is about six to eight years. And they have three study areas on the coast. One at Pacopalus, excuse me, one at Copalis, one at Twin Harbors, one at Long Beach. They're closed to the public. If you see this area near Ocean City where it's a quarter mile of posts, that area is closed so they can study what goes on without human impact. So they can monitor a year class, see how it grows up, how it dies off, and how it's, um, a new year class comes in. When you're digging clams, you quite frequently see little shows, big shows, 
That just means that your class is overlaid. But what's really interesting is we tell people a bigger hole means usually a bigger clam. Not always true. But what's interesting, in the late 90s, all the clams were settling high. Women historically do not like to get wet when they're clam digging. Men have their surf waders on, they're out. But in the late 90s, the women were down the beach and back into the beach while the men were still pounding their heads off in the water there, and they had bigger clams. So for about a four or five year period, the limits of clams and women were bigger than the limits of clam and men because they didn't want to get wet and they just stayed high. So it was really kind of funny to watch it. You interview and they're asking, where's your husband? Where's your sons? Oh, they're still in the water playing out there. We got done a long time ago. Kind of fun to watch. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So this is the life history of the razor clam. And this is what they use to help drive how they're going to have seasons. So what they do is um, there's a number of beaches up and down the coast. There's the Long Beach Peninsula. There's the Twin Harbors. And again, you're welcome to come take a look at these later on. Twin, oh, Twin Harbors, the Copalis area the Mock Rocks area, which is the Copalis Rocks to the city of Moclips, and then there's Claylock. Claylock's federal, so it's, it's closed quite frequently. We have to work with the feds on that. I keep saying we, I've been gone 36 years, I can't get on the we mode yet. So um, these are the areas, this is co-managed. These areas, Copalis Beach, Mock Rocks Beach, um, the 1854-1855 treaty, the Olympia Treaty, gave the uh, the Quinaults right to the usual and custom area to salmon. Well, it was reinterpreted in the 90s to mean shellfish too. So this area north of where we're at further north is what's called uh, usual and custom areas for the Quinaults. So it's split 50-50, so it's co-managed. So this area, whatever the number of clams is determined here, is split 50% for the tribes, 50% for non-tribal people. And they, they'll agree on dates to open, like tomorrow, tonight we're gonna be open here, so the tribes won't be out digging tonight here. So they'll day so to avoid problems, because quite frequently, people will have their 15 clams and see someone coming up with a sack of 60. Go, whoa, there's a violator. But that was a tribal person, usual and custom area, the tribal subsistence 60. So to avoid conflict, they just don't dig on the same days now. But quite frequently, their season will go much longer than ours. But there's, there's only, a f when I was working, there were 206 registered tribal diggers versus on a good weekend here, six to 10,000. So we get our share very quickly compared to the tribal people here. So when you see people digging out here, it's very important to keep in mind that you didn't get the news, it's most likely tribal entities digging. So, and then these areas here are non-tribal areas, so we don't have to share. So what they do is, we, in the old days, we used to go and dig up every clam in a certain area to figure out how many clams are there. Now they have this pumping technology. So this is the ocean, this is upland, this would be the sand dunes, and they pick these tracks. They're computer generated from Long Beach all the way up, every mile. A m computer will say, this mile, this mile, this mile, this mile, this mile, this mile, mile. So it's all random. And then they have a computer that says you'll do six tracks to the north, six tracks, it tells you like six, 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 and it's two, four, six, eight, ten. it's 12. So what they'll do is in these circles, which are, I have the thing here, I think they're half of a cubic, one half of a square centimeter, these rings. They lay them down. They emulsify the sand, and they dip everything out so they can get from this size all the way up here. So then what they can do is, by digging them all out here, they know which new babies are coming in, the new year class. They know how many two-year-olds there are, three-year-olds, five-year-olds, and six-year-olds there are. And what they can use then is use this to project for the entire coast, where the big ones are, where the small ones are, are they high, are they low, are they mixed? And so when you get news releases that um, they're not finding any here and they're finding a lot here and they're finding a lot here and nothing up here, it's how they disperse and how they settle on the beach. They don't settle uniformly. So it used to be in the old days, the public by, inter by doing interviews didn't want anything under four inches. That's where they started sorting and throwing them away. Um, now as time's gone along, they're happy. I think it's about three and a half inches. So they try to wait until the growth of the majority of the clams hits three and a half inches, and then they open the season. The reason that is to avoid wastage. 
We're going to talk about that in a little while. So when you see, for instance, that certain beaches have more days than other beaches, it's based on the availability of clams. They'll figure out how many clams there are and based on these surveys here, and then they'll open the beaches accordingly. So that's what you see with the, this, you can read all about this here. So once the season, once they figure out how many clams there are, they try to make it go as long as possible, knowing the history of a given area. For instance, this area gets hammered much harder than the Twin Harbors area does. Long Beach gets hit really hard too, especially by Oregonians. And they like coming up here because they know it's a quality resource. So what they try to do, and the reason, that in the old days, the season used to be May through October. But now, because the human population is bigger and bigger and more people are doing this, they try to make it go longer to benefit the local businesses, the economy. So they used to do it every day. <clears throat> and now they kind of switch off. So they can make it go out farther, take some of the impact off the area. So when the seasons appear to be herky-jerky, there's usually a reason. This area is very unique because you have a uh, usual and custom area with the treaty tribes. And the seasons went along really well until 1983. It used to be up until 1983, it was open nine months of the year. 1983, something happened that had never been seen before. About 98% of the clams died off. That summer, people were reporting seagulls pulling clams out of the sand. And that's not a normal attribute of the clams. So what was going on was we used uh, three-quarter ton pickup trucks, chased seagulls down to get them to drop clams. And we got enough back, got a half a dozen or a dozen. They found this new disease. If uh, you're younger than um, 37 years old, you wouldn't be aware of this. But it was called NIX, Nuclear Inclusion Unknown. It was a bacteria that invaded the nucleus of the cell. Initially, everybody was scared to death. They thought nuclear is in radiation. This was a nuclear bacteria. So everyone was really scared of clams altogether early on. And we had to educate them that the center of a cell is called the nucleus and how a nucleus works and everything. And this disguises, disguises itself as nuclear material. It invades the cell. The cell swells up and it ruptures. So clam gills are like fish gills. The water passes through passageways. They extract oxygen. But when the gills collapse, they can't get water through. So it's a clam's version of pneumonia, everybody said. So it makes sense. So clam pneumonia. Well, anyhow, they finally described it. The seasons opened up for a little bit in 1986-87. It was, didn't really get back going again until 1989. Then in 1991, something else happened. So we haven't yet got the tribal issue. So we're closed because of the NICs. 1991 was when we started finding what's called domoic acid, amnesic shellfish poisoning. And this had been seen in the 80s on the Canadian Eastern Seaboard. And amnesic shellfish poisoning is more toxic than red tide. They were always monitored for red tide. I don't think there's been ever a red tide issue for a razor clams. And what the health department was doing at that time was injecting clam serum into mice. And depending on how they responded to it, there were body things, body motions they looked for, then they would open or close the season. In 1991, they injected clam serum into mice. They lost the ability to use the back half of their body. It went rigid. So they were pulling themselves along, but the, the, the moribund was the back of their body. So they'd never seen this before. About the same time this was happening, the um, pelican populations were nose diving on the California coast. They were feeding anchovies to their chicks. And so what they found was this was the domoic acid. And it's four times more toxic than red tide. And people would, it's very interesting, when I was doing public meetings at that time, people were asking me, why can't we make the decision to close or, or go out and dig for ourselves? It, the season was, it was 15 micrograms per, I forget the unit, it's very scientific, very, very small amounts in which people with compromised immune systems would get sick. Diabetes, people who had stroke, people who had underlying, so the very weakest members of our population would get sick. So people would say, I'm healthy, let me decide for myself. And so what we did is we consulted with the state attorney general and we asked him, can we have people sign waivers? make up their own decision, sign a waiver that we're not responsible, let them go out and decide whether they want to eat the clams or not. And the state attorney general at this time said, you can't sign away your right to litigate. So we had to close it. So I decided to come about it from another standpoint. I decided when I did the meetings, 
I would tell the people in the room, we could have a cl clam season, but we have to kill one person in the room before the evening's over. Who volunteers? I never had a volunteer. So um, anyhow, it's something to be taken very seriously. And to give you an idea how serious this stuff is, the moic acid or amnesia shellfish poisoning, if you Google it, in 2006, a restaurant in Prince Edward Island had a specialty over the weekend, steamed mussels. 206 people ordered the steamed mussels at this restaurant in the fall of 1983, I think it was. And when the, when the weekend was over, six of them were dead, six of them were permanently institutionalized, and the rest were in the hospital. What amnesic shellfish poisoning does to you if you get a small hit is it goes to the front right lobe of your brain. The front right lobe of your brain is where you learn new information and you transfer it to other parts of your body. If the front right lobe of your brain is fried, you'll never learn anything new again. And to give you an idea of how serious this is, there was one person who survived it, a physics professor from the University of Montreal. He survived, and during interviews, they asked him physics questions. He was able to answer all the physics questions. He learned it and stored it somewhere else. But since he recovered, one of his children had gotten married and they brought him or her, I don't remember which one it was that was married, into the room. And he denied that he was at the wedding. They had pictures. He said they had to have been photoshopped or forged. I was not at the wedding. My daughter and my son didn't get married. He can't process anything new. And in this film, they took him into a grocery store. And it was a new grocery store in his neighborhood. This was fascinating to me. They walked him through the grocery store to the back of the grocery store. When you think about it, when you're going into a grocery store, you make a photogenic, photographic map of where you're going and how to get back to the checkout aisle. They took him to the back of the grocery store and they asked him to please walk to the cashier stand. He started crying. This is a man in his 70s. He did not know how to find the front of the grocery store. So this is really serious stuff. It's not every, I've had people tell me, you want all 28 miles of the beach to yourself. That's the reason you're closing it. You're denying us the right to, so everyone in the Fish and Wildlife can have clams to themselves. This is something really, really serious. I got a question I'm going to ask. Yeah. So is it in the internals or is it throughout the nation? No, thank you for bringing that up. Um, razor clams. You mentioned the mussels. Mussels, yeah, no, mussels. I mean, mussels, for whatever reason, the animal is called um, pseudonychia. It's a diatom. Raise, uh, mussels flush it out. Razor clams take the toxin when they digest these critters and put it into their fatty tissues which is the digger, which we like the best. So when we have steamer clams and stuff, we eat everything. But on razor clams, we clean the guts out, but they take the toxin and move it into the soft tissue. So, and people have asked me, can I rinse it out? Can I freeze it out? Does it cook out? No, it stays there. So just like finish all the toxin goes Yes, the yeah. And what's interesting, when the razor clam season was closed, when they first started happening, it's 15 parts per million, or it's even less micrograms or something. Some of the razor clams at Twin Harbors and Long Beach registered over 3,000. They were like bombs, basically. So um, you can't get rid of it on the razor clam, unfortunately, by just cleaning off, cutting off the dark part and stuff. Now, thank you for, for mentioning that. So they had to deal with this through the 80s into the 90s, and then in 93, the Supreme Court said the tribes had the right to 50% of the shellfish in their usual and custom areas. So you have three things working against non-tribal people, or actually tribal people, because they have to follow the same <coughs> guidelines for health reasons. But for non-tribal people, you have red tide, you have tribal rights, you have demoic acid, uh, you have all kinds of variables. Now, so when the season seems herky-jerky, there's a reason. Do you have, do you have one of you have a question? Oh, I, I just didn't catch where you said that happened. Oh, Prince Edward Island was where that episode happened in 1983. Prince of Edward the Island on our coast. Eastern oh. Canada. Oh, Eastern Prince Edward Canada. Islands in okay. Canada. That was the first documented case of demoic acid in the Northern Hemisphere. And it was mussels. It was mussels. But they, we, for wherever he's going on here, it's not showing up in the mussels. And it's not showing up in oysters. They don't know what's quite what's going on. But what's interesting is people want to know if this is new. And what's interesting is we've since learned since the 80s and the 90s the Japanese knew about this in old times. They knew that shellfish were tainted at certain times. So what they would do is it takes a while for this to kick in. 
They'd have a banquet for their enemy, someone we wanted to get rid of. They'd have a seafood banquet. These people would go home and die, and there was no way of correlating it to the banquet. So this is how they got rid of it. It's documented in Chinese lit uh, Japanese literature, 15, 1600s, how they'd have a seafood banquet. They wanted to get rid of X and Y. They'd invite them to dinner. They ate, they went home, and they died, and the problem was solved. They couldn't relate it back to them. So, but what's also interesting with red tide, we're getting more and more of this is happening. What's happening is these uh, t toxins are caused by dinoflagellates and diatoms, little plants. And they need warmer water and they need nutrients. And it usually happens after a flushing of straight to Juan de Fuca. We get a big rainfall in September and October, flushes the boat out, the, the near shore current moves southerly in the fall and the winter. So it brings all this, all this nutrient load onto the beach and the, the toxins can flourish and proliferate, the clams eat it. In the spring and the fall, the near shore current moves south to north, it changes. So it takes all the toxins away from us. But once these clams are hot, they don't flush it for a long time. So um, it's really, it's really a, a dance, it's a balancing act for fish and wildlife right now, when to open the seasons and you gotta have enough clams. And, it's, it's a lot of variables. They're not trying to jerk you around if you just look into it a little bit. They're trying to give you the maximum opportunity, but you gotta have clams. So, so they can kind of figure out when it's gonna happen? That, okay, and what they do, thanks for bringing that up. The health department, like the season today, they have to have two clean samples 10 days apart before you announce. So 10 days ago there was a sample, and 10 days before that there was a sample. Both of them came back less than 15 parts 15 nanograms or something. So they're clean. It can change quickly. So um, that's why they do this 10 days before too. So they, they're, they're monitoring it very closely. They have to have, they take it's six clams from intervals on the beach and one hot clam out of six can close it down. They don't know why that is. One could be over 15 and the rest are all near zero but one hot clam closes it down. What's also interesting about marine toxins is when Captain Gray and Captain Vancouver were sailing along our coast in the late 1700s, they wrote in their journals, and no one paid any attention to this, that the Indians would have a banquet when the ships came, sailors came ashore, and they always served the dogs in the village 24 hours before the um, banquet went forward. And Captain Gray or Vancouver, I forget which one wrote in 1793, I'm, I'm very, very offended that they're serving all the prepared meals to the animals before they're serving it to us. But apparently it was never explained to him. They knew about toxins back then. And they fed the dogs first, all the seafood, before they ate themselves so they could see what was going on. So this is not new, but it is, it is, there is an uptick in it all over the world that's going on. So once they know, how many clams there are, they will um, open the season accordingly. And you've got to have clams over three and a half inches. These guys here are slower growing than these up here. When you see the surf, for instance, right now is extremely muddy, that's clam food. That's diatoms they like. In the past, people associated that with sewage sludge because it stinks when it comes up and it's real foamy on the beach. And if you get it in your car through the kids or the dogs or something, it's nasty. And it, it looks like poopy di diaper type stuff material. But um, the more of that there is on the beach, the bigger and fatter the clams are gonna be. So people want more poopy sludge on the beach knowing <laughs> the clams are gonna be bigger. But that, that, that's a diatom that they like to eat. So that you'll see the surf is really muddy right now. Some areas are muddy, some areas are clean, some areas are muddy. Nothing comes in uniformly up and down the coast. So what they do is when they have the clam season, they, um, the biologists will drive on the beach They've done interviews where they'll stop on the beach. They'll have one biologist on every beach approach, the entire coast. And they do what's called ingress and egress. They interview every car coming on the beach, every car driving off the beach for four hours. It's a real pain in the tush. And you stop every car, and sometimes you're really coming off if you've been on a big clam tide, and the backup gets used. All we can do is apologize. But they want to know how many people were in the vehicle, how many people were digging, did you get your limits or not? And then, to back it up, they drive the beach either north to south or south to north, <coughs> two people in a vehicle, one person counts going south, and they count everybody with clickers, every individual. This is daylight hours. I'll tell you how they do nighttime in a moment. They count, and all one person does is as fast as they can click, 
they don't change their eyes on the horizon and they'll shout 2,000, 150, 4,051, and someone who's driving, who's watching out for hitting children and dogs and everybody else, <laughs> drives south and tells the person, get ready to stop at one-tenth of a mile. They count every individual. Then they come back the other way and they randomly stop at each mile and interview people. How many were in your group? How many, uh, how many clams did you have? And they use that to extrapolate and figure out how many clams were harvested on any given day. So if you hear on the news, it was almost bag limits or 14.4 or 13.2, it's based on those interviews. At nighttime, it's more tricky. What they'll do is they've stopped in the past and asked people, how many in your group? How many lighting devices do you have? So then they can go in the dark and count all the lighting devices, multiply that through, turn around and then interview people and extrapolate to figure out how many clams there were in the, in the whole day from that beach. So very labor intensive. During daylight hours, what they'll do is after they've interviewed people, is they'll go back and they'll have two or three people in the vehicle and they drop them off on the beach and all they go do is go down with a bucket and a clicker and they stick their hand down all the holes that have been dug to see how many have been left behind. And this is really good information for people who are inclined to leave clams behind. Um, what they'll do is just randomly walk and start sticking their hands down holes and try to do in, in increments of 100, 100, 200, 300 holes. It just walk south or north. It's fascinating when I've been down on the beach before because I wear regular clothes, so I kind of blend in. But invariably, someone will come up to me and ask you, would you like to learn how to dig properly? Because I don't have any digging advice. All I have is a bucket and a clicker. And then I tell them, no, I'm with Fish and Wildlife. The whole beach opens up in a matter of seconds. <laughs> you have a whole mile stretch of beach with nobody around. And so then I have the whole beach to myself. It's absolutely fascinating to watch the dynamics of how people get out of your way when they find out who you are. And one time I was on the beach and I was um, watching a, a very attractive woman, two teenage girls, flipping clams into the surf. And I went up and I said, you really can't do that. I identified myself. And she said, well, they're too small and we don't want them. And I said, well, it's $76 a piece if you are seen throwing one back by someone like me. And I've seen you and your daughters, I assume your daughters throwing them back. And um, she very nicely told me to F off. And I wouldn't have expected that from this woman at all. So I asked her to come up with a vehicle. I called an officer. I have had the ability to detain you. I couldn't give a ticket. And I just asked him to give each one of them, her and each of her daughters, a ticket for $76, which he did. Which for the girls is a misdemeanor. And if they had jobs, they'd have to report that they not weren't necessarily felons, but they do have they're going to have conviction on their record. So it's very important to consider if you're wasting clams and you get caught and you're working, you now have to mark a box if you ever had any violations. Uh, but I was watching one day an elderly gentleman with three preteen girls padding down a hole. This was up at Moclips. And I just watched for the longest time and I could see they had four bags of clams and they were smoothing this hole out, very artistically being done. And I went up and introduced myself. And I had to tell him to stay there, and I had covered the hole, and it had 23 smashed clams in it. And he said it wasn't ours. And I said, I watched you with, I assume, your granddaughters doing this. And so uh, they, all the clams, they had 15 clams each, were all whole. He had obviously, Grandpa had sorted all the clams for them and put all the ones they didn't want back in the bag. We went back and forth for quite a while. No, it's not my clam. Yes, it's your clam. No, it's your clam. Finally, the littlest girl, about 10 years old, said, Grandpa, why are you saying this isn't ours? We do this every time we come. <laughs> and so um, I thought the best way for the girls to learn was to take him up to the tick, up to the truck, call the enforcement officer, and he got a ticket for 76 times 23. So um, three little girls had to stand there while he, he wrote them up for that. <coughs> that had to stop. Um, the biggest violation I ever found in my life, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more, was to watch a couple of Grayland walking up the beach with chest waders. And I could see them from where I was, digging and coming together, digging and coming together, and I could see with binoculars they had, it looked like full of sacks. But they kept coming up, coming together and separating, coming together and separating. Finally they started walking up the beach, and their legs were widely apart. And it looked like a child carrying a full diaper. And um, I thought, what's going on here? So they came up to the truck, I introduced myself. I said, I'd like to measure your clams. And they said, sure, they gave me their bags. And I said, I now wanna watch you take your chest waders off. And he says, we drive home with our chest waders on. And I said, that's good, because this is your truck. I'd like to see each of you get up in your, in the, in the, pull yourself up into the truck. And I would, I, say, I would judge them to the time before I knew to be in their late 70s. 
finally they looked at each other and they go, we have a full, full few extras. So they said, that's fine, take off your chest waders and dump them on the tailgate. They had 15 in each sack, and between their chest waders, they had 423. Oh, no. So um, they dumped them, I called the officer, and back in that time period, this would have been the 80s, it was um, $19, $10 a piece for your first 15 over, and then $19 a piece from number 31 on up. So you can just do the math in your head for that one and stuff. But I, when the officer showed me their license, I looked at it, they were 80 and 81 years old. So I looked at them and I said, I have to compliment you. One, I hope I'm alive when I'm 80 and 81, and I hope I'm as dexterous as you are when I'm 80 and 81. <laughs> but this is a hell of a legacy to leave to your grandchildren, if you have grandchildren uh, for the future. So these are some of the things we see when we're on the beach. Um, so what they do is they go along the beach and then they measure the clamps. So I was talking about stopping them. So What's going on is we're driving along and I'm, I'm using a clicker for 12 miles going like this as fast as I can. And then when he tells me to stop, I have to keep my place and then start in again. So we count everybody. Then they measure something to find out this is where we know where the big ones are. So this validates what we did here where we're trying to figure out what the big ones are. So we measure them. And then that's how you get information on the limits and then where the big ones are. So when you hear news reports that really big ones at Twin Harbors, kind of small, mo clips, it's based on all these interviews that are going on. So this has all been com become computerized since I, I left 12 years ago. So now they have machines that can measure the clamps and stuff. It's really, really fast. So one of the things that you encounter when you're on the beach is you'll see the sludge that I talked about. You also, if you clean clams, you'll find little crabs inside clams. You'll see little crabs inside. Those are called pea crabs. And they don't hurt the quality of the clam at all. Just get rid of them. Um, each kind of cra clam has a different type of pea crab. How they choose where to home based on the species, I don't know. But the, the gooey duck pea crab is different from the horse clam, which is different from the razor clam pea crab. And usually you'll find a boy and a girl that pick up residency inside of a clam. And they're what's called commensals. They're not parasites. The clam is sucking in water and food. They get oxygen and free food and free housing. So they don't hurt the clam. A parasite hurts the animal it's living with. So you'll see those. Sometimes there's a little blenny inside that you'll see that lives inside, a very slender blenny, which faces up, captures the food as it's coming in from the clam. The other thing people see quite frequently on their beach, and they'll stop me, they want to know why all the crabs are dying. And they'll see all the shells laying all over the beach. People still don't realize the crabs have to molt in order to grow. So um, little adult crabs, girls move in the spring, boys move in the fall. So during the spring tides, you're going to see a lot of female dungeon crabs on the beach. You're always going to see little crab shells because they're like little little human beings. They're eating their parents out of house and home and changing their clothes all the time. <laughs> so you're, every month, cra little crabs will change their shell. But when they're adults at three, three and a half years, girls are in the spring, boys are in the summer. There's no children here, so I can share another fact with you. Um, the crabs, the boy crabs are following the females around so they can only mate. They can only mate for 72 hours after they shed their shell. The overducks are only open for three days, then they seal over. So the crab fishery in the winter is way offshore. You can barely see the lights. By the time we get in the spring and summer, the crab fishery is near shore, and you can see the men and women working on the back of the decks. That's how short it is, how shallow it is. But the males are all waiting for the females to shed their shells so they can mate. And then the females will mate, move off into deep water. The males will stay for a few more months and shed their shell. If you've ever backed a crab before, I, I'll talk more about this on my talk tomorrow, fun facts about sea life. When you back a crab and you pull the belly flap back, there's four penises. <laughs> High school kids love this fact. And the boys all want to grow up to be a crab when they grow up. <laughs> so there's two majors and two minors. So when you back a crab, that's what you're looking at on the, on the crab there.
Thank you.